Vsauce, Kevin here, with a math problem, or a moral problem, or both. In 1972, two men were convicted of cashing fraudulent checks, one for $58.40 and the other for $35.20. Neither had a criminal history. One got 30 days, the other got 15 years. In the Arizona vs. Marlowe murder case, the defendant was sentenced to death and his co-defendant, who also participated in the killing, got just four years. And a 2016 working paper from the National Bureau of Economic Research showed that judges in Louisiana gave harsher sentences to juvenile offenders on the Mondays after the LSU Tigers football team lost a game. What makes criminal sentencing so unfair? At the most basic level, justice is giving people what they deserve. Part of that might be punitive. If you've harmed someone else or society in general, maybe you deserve to be punished. Part might be protection, that society shouldn't be exposed to continual threats of harm. Or should sentences be purely about restitution and rehabilitation, with a restorative focus on healing the victim and improving the offender. If so, should a criminal only serve as much time as it takes to make sure it won't happen ever again? A just sentence has to find a balance between all these valid philosophical questions, and outcomes can vary tremendously from judge to judge. Tremendously. In 1973, the sentence in the United States for a federal charge of kidnapping was any term of years to life. You could get probation or you could get 25 years, depending on the judge. Federal Judge Marvin Frankel called the potential for sentencing disparities unthinkable in a government of laws, not men. His book, Law Without Order, exposed shocking variations in federal sentencing as a result of a complex system in which hundreds of years of ever-evolving law can determine your guilt, while a robed public official who's in a bad mood because they've got heartburn can make you pay whatever price they want in that moment. Frankel highlighted the almost wholly unchecked and sweeping powers we give to judges in the fashioning of sentences and he called them terrifying and intolerable for a society that professes devotion to the rule of law. But the math-based cure was worse than the disease of human variability. Here's the thing. Sentencing is hard. Look, let's try to solve sentencing for property crime right now. A judge calculates the amount of labor it takes the crime victim to get a thing and a thief serves exactly that amount of time as punishment for stealing it. So let's say you make $20 an hour, someone steals your $1,000 TV, so they'd serve the 50 hours of labor they took from you. The sentence fits the harm done in the crime, and everyone's sentence would be calculated without prejudice. That sounds perfectly fair, right? Wrong! We've just incentivized everyone to go steal Elon Musk's car because your punishment would only be the two minutes of labor it took him to buy it. Every incarnation of justice has unintended consequences. But you can eliminate statistical outliers. The Sentencing Reform Act passed in 1984 as a result of Frankel's advocacy for a fairer, more consistent justice system, and both Republicans and Democrats supported its introduction of objectivity, putting crimes through a complex algorithm to determine sentences with mandatory minimums and maximums that lessened the impact of outright bias and just plain philosophical disagreement among judges. Rehabilitation was abandoned. Simple punishment was the goal. And what's more objective than numbers and formulas? It worked like this. 
a crime was assigned one of 43 levels. So trespassing is level 4, kidnapping is level 32. Then levels could be added or subtracted based on the specifics of a crime. A level 20 robbery would become a level 25 if a firearm was brandished, and a level 27 if it was actually fired. If the offender was a lesser participant in the crime, four levels would be taken away down to level 23. Did they accept responsibility? Two more levels gone. One level gone for pleading guilty, back to level 20. Then that number was put into a six category criminal history table to calculate the range of sentencing. For a level 20 offense by someone with a category three criminal history, 41 to 51, months. But even determining levels ended up having problems. In the 1991 case Chapman v. United States, the court decided that the medium in which a drug was transmitted would count as the weight of the drug being factored into a dealer's sentence. The case involved LSD. Selling 100 doses in sugar cubes came with a sentence of 188 to 235 months. Another dealer with 100 doses in paper would get 63 to 78 months because paper weighs so much less than sugar cubes. 100 doses of pure, unadulterated LSD with no mixture? Only 10 to 16 months. One single dose of LSD in this gallon of chalky milk would get me sentenced for about four kilos of Schedule One drugs and serve over 20 years in prison as a first time offender. None of this makes any sense. An appeals judge said, to base punishment on the weight of the carrier medium makes about as much sense as basing punishment on the weight of the defendant. Running crimes through rubrics and point systems to determine arbitrary numerical values, divorced sentences from the unique aspects of the crime and its victims, and the characteristics of the offender. It also totally nullifies a judge's lifetime of professional expertise. But mandatory federal sentencing guidelines actually did solve problems. A study by the U.S. Sentencing Commission found that in 1986, sentences varied by about 17%. And just seven years later, that variation was cut to 11%. Mandated sentences cut down the influence of judges' whims against some defendants and in favor of others. But it didn't matter. The Supreme Court struck down federal sentencing mandates in 2005, citing a violation of the Sixth Amendment. Just three years after Marvin Frankel's death, sentencing mandates were now just suggested guidelines and the variations in sentencing came right back. So, in some ways, the algorithms worked. It reduced extreme sentences, some systemic bias, statistical noise, and standard deviations. And it also failed badly with its robotic, arbitrary, and sometimes nonsensical results that flat out made some things much, much worse, like messed up mandatory minimum and determinate sentences. Judges were happy to get their professional discretion back. 75% preferred the new system of using the guidelines as an advisory tool, while only 3% preferred pure mandates. But how does one human mind discern exactly the right amount of punishment? If you steal something, why isn't it enough to just pay the person back? How fair is it that someone can take a life yet only pay with 10 or 12 years of their own? To what exact degree does a first-time offender differ from a second-time offender from a 10th-time offender? Do we ever just give up on rehabilitation? Is a criminal responsible for the harm he does to future generations? 
Does an eye for an eye mean severe retribution, or does it actually place a limit on a fitting punishment? Are there any crimes we should just accept? Should senile elderly people be responsible for the crimes of their youth? Should we even have victimless crime? Is the possibility of injustice the price we have to pay for a chance at perfect justice? Are we trying to punish criminals, rehabilitate them, separate them from society, a combination of all three? If so, what's the proper balance of that? And how do we reduce conscious bias, unconscious variability, and noise at a national level that still allows for the nuance of individual circumstances to be addressed fairly, city, state, and country-wide? What's the algorithm to figure out all of that? What's the algorithm for morality? What's the algorithm for justice? And as always, thanks for watching.